Hello, my beautiful people, my friends and family who have no equal. How are you guys doing today? Blessed be upon you. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the broadcast. As always, bro, it's a good feeling just to know that you feel me, your friends feel me, everybody's really tuning in and going with what's going on with this program. It's a pleasant feeling. So, with that being said, today we've got three cool subjects to talk to you guys about. One, aliens. Second, good and bad food. Three, pets, exotic animals. Now, some of you guys might not like the alien section. Some of you guys might like, not, not like, uh, might not like the food segment. But all of you guys love me. I love all of you guys to death. I love you guys even just for taking the time to press the like button, press the subscribe button. I love you guys just for even taking the time to tune in. So we're going to have the conversation. And when I do this podcast, the goal is to bring people who have totally different interests, totally different tastes, to bring them all in this one area where we have a great conversation with each other. With that being said, let's start the show. Oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do a little bit different today. Yeah, some of y'all might remember this song. For those of you guys who grew up in the '80s and '70s, you might know what I'm talking about with this song. Uh, 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 uh. Welcome to the Paradise Podcast. Let's go. You know, it's funny because if you check back in history, back in the 1990s, literally all New Jack City songs had the same song. New Jack Swing songs had the same type of beat. So anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I can't stress that anymore. Um, I'm just going to tell you guys, first off... um, it's been a blessing doing this podcast. For if this is the first time that you're tuning in, listening to me, I want to say thank you so much. You know, um, like I said, this podcast comes out Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. every day, Monday through Friday. I also do two other podcasts. I I do the other two podcasts because they're more they're more niche interest with those other podcasts. So when I'm doing them, I'm more focusing on talking to people who like writing or other people who like talking about anime. But this podcast, this one that you're listening to right now, is the one where if you are just a regular person going through your regular day life, you just want somebody to listen to you or want somebody to talk to, you can come here and listen to me. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. And that's why I have a fun time doing this job because it's, it's a dream, man. It's a dream to be able to broadcast to people across the whole world. So, let's see what happens. Let's see how we go with this segment. And let's see what happens when we talk about what we're going to talk about. So, first thing is aliens. Apparently, Tower Banks' forehead might not be the only proof of alien existence in the world. Shout out to Tower Banks, too. She's very sexy. But anyway, China just completed the largest... China literally just built the largest telescope in the world to exist. Well, they say largest radio telescope, but from what I've seen and from what they've measured and seen, the radio telescope is the size of 30 football fields. So apparently this is a pretty big ass telescope. Excuse my language. Um, the reason why they built this telescope is because the radio telescope can actually transmit radio waves into the space past the get past the um, Milky past the Milky Way and past our galaxy to try to find other planets and to try to find other extraterrestrial life that might exist so to put it in one sentence china is really about that i'm about to find an alien life they really about that thug life they really about that i'm about to find an alien and i'm surprised they put this much work into finding aliens i'm I'm really surprised about that i mean of course we most national space programs that's the goal, I think, is for them to find an extra, extraterrestrial life or to get to another planet before the other country does. Like in the 1960s when they had the old big, um, the whole big moon race where every country was trying to get to the moon faster. Russia was against the uh, United States in the race of trying to get to the moon. Of course, we beat them. Some say we lied about beating them, but you know, hey, it is what it is. Um... What I was talk reason wanted to bring up aliens and I wanted to I wanted this to be the subject of the conversation was because outside of China being outside of China building their own telescope, there's this one satellite called Juno that the NASA built, and they launched it in 2011, 
and it took about five years to go into space and f- get to Jupiter, to the orbit of Jupiter. And basically what happens is once it reaches Jupiter, it's going to, once it reaches Jupiter, the job of it is it's supposed to take pictures of Europa, it's supposed to take pictures of Ganymede, it's supposed to take pictures of all the Jupiter's moons. And hopefully we can get an idea from that and see if there might be hints of extraterrestrial life or get the idea of the core mass density of Jupiter, which to this day I don't understand what the hell that means, but to get an idea of what Jupiter is made of, to get an idea of the planets and, you know, just take pictures and see. And it's weird because I remember two days ago when I found out about this, I went on CNN's website and that's where I saw the article talking about it. And this lady, the the lady who wrote the article for it, she had put alien spacecraft spotted near Jupiter. Now, this bitch, excuse my language, she know when she put that article what everybody would be thinking. She know exactly what everybody would be thinking. But at the same time, you know, it worked. But, you know, I understand that when you put an article, you have to put a headline that's really catchy that makes people want to go to it. So I understand that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, do your job. Get your little $14 an hour. So she, I went and checked it out and it said about the space car being there. And I really got me thinking, man, like, might there be aliens on Jupiter? Might there be aliens on these planets that prior scientists have set up to this point? It was impossible for them to exist there. You know, I've always thought, like, the reason that a lot of um, scientists and astrologists, have all, astronomers have always said that if you go to moon, Mars, and Uranus, that there is no alien life there is because... They said the atmosphere is too harsh. They said that out of Uranus, Neptune, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Pluto, which they keep going back and forth and saying it's a planet or it's not a planet or it is a planet or it's not a planet. I think Neil Strauss confirmed that it is a planet. I'm not sure. But they keep saying because when you go to all these planets, the atmosphere is too harsh. They don't have oxygen. They don't have um, suitable. They don't have suitable air for breathable lungs for airs to breathe. Um, my opinion is I've always said is I think you have to look at that scenario with the, just a little bit more imagination because if you go to these planets hypothetically and it life does develop on those planets it might not have to develop with the same requirements that we have to survive like for us we keep looking at it through how could you develop there if there's no oxygen how could you develop there if there's no gravity I remember when I was watching Dragon Ball Z the Saiyans in Dragon Ball Z which I, I'm just hoping that you're a Dragon Ball Z fan. The Saiyans in Dragon Ball Z were so much more stronger than the humans because where they grew up on in Planet Vegeta, the gravity was so much stronger, so they had to develop stronger bones and they had to develop stronger bodies. What if in those con- what if in those planets, because there was no oxygen and because the gravity is so strong, they grew up having to breathe without oxygen and grew up in places where you didn't have where you had to have stronger bones and bodies, so therefore you don't need gravity. Even how and even how they see like the real ways from the radio telescopes that we do have prior to the one that China just built, how they can target these planets and detect detect sound waves and detect people who are living there. And even if they say you can't detect them, hell, they might be living in atmospheres where it's hard to detect them. You know, even with this Juno satellite that got sent to Jupiter, that they were saying that even you know, funny thing first off, let me just say this. The Juno satellite cost one point one billion dollars to create. They sent this telescope into Jupiter. It took six years to get there, and when it got there, they said just this week that they aren't sure that it might survive the radiation in Jupiter because the atmosphere of Jupiter, the radiation is so strong that even though the satellite is built out of titanium, it might be destroyed by the radiation. Now, before you spent $1.1 billion, that should have been a discussion that you guys sat down a long time and thought about. Because if I was the person who put my money into that and invested in that, I sure would have said, you know what, maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't send, spend $1.1 billion on a hunk of metal to go somewhere where I don't think it's even going to last for three minutes once it arrives. But, you know, that that's just my opinion. I want you guys to give me your opinion and tell me what do you think about that, honestly. I'm not just trying to, not just attacking the alien nerds. But anyway, so, it might be true, you know, even with this radio telescope with China, the radio telescope can reach past the Milky Way and past our galaxy. So, 
it could contact other races that live on different planets outside of ours. I I have a lot of hope in this one because I'm getting tired of NASA and all these other space programs um, giving us all these random. They give us all these random articles of information talking about how there we've discovered 16 super Earths or we discovered this many other planets, but they've never given us any concrete information. They've never given us pictures of the aliens that they say might exist. That's my problem. You know, like. A few months ago, NASA announced that they had a really big announcement, like a really, really big announcement. And we kept thinking, oh, they found an alien life form or they might have found a spacecraft or we found this or we found that. Come to find out, they just said that just to say we found we found theory that there might exist maybe at least four or five different other galaxies where you might have planets that have life forms living there. We found proof that there might be other galaxies living there. But. Five years ago, you guys said that you guys found 16 or 17 super Earths. So basically what you did was you made us wait five years longer to give us the same information that you already knew five years ago. That's just retarded. Like, I feel like they were just doing that just to get headlines so they can get more funding from other investors to keep forward on their space program. Because it's only so long that we're going to keep tolerating you giving us theories and no pictures. You know, we just don't like that. Nobody likes to hear that. Personally, what I feel is if there is aliens on these other planets that they have, like these other super Earths and these other uh, planets orbiting the galaxy, I feel like my theory is there might they might not be as developed as we think they are. You know, they might be in the same predicament that we are in where even though they want to go see if there's other aliens, if they, even if they want to go see that there's other life outside of their planets, they might not possess the technology available to do so. So what will happen is, is if this radio telescope that China made actually makes contact with those aliens, they might have a telescope like ours or might be as developed as we are technology wise to where they'll contact us and say, hey, OK, we'd be interested in meeting you, but we don't have no way to contact you. We don't have no way to get to. You. We don't have the spaceship technology or any of that to go to your planet because you live so far away. And it's interesting. It's really interesting. I always love talking about the theory of aliens because I've always wondered like what other life exists out there besides us. I've always wondered like what other life is out there living and breathing every day besides us. And with these aliens, with the thought of aliens existing, I've always wondered, like, when they come here, what's going to happen? You know, when do they come here? Is life going to change? Are they going to try to conquer us, as so many movies have shown in Hollywood? Are they going to try to befriend us? Or are they going to give us technology that makes us live longer, that makes us get rid of diseases? You know, that's why, if you aren't familiar with this one video game called Assassin's Creed, that's why I love that video game so much because... When you played the video game, in the second game, they had a they came up with the concept of the concept that they used to explain why the assassins were so skilled at fighting and why they possessed eagle vision and why they possessed all these different abilities. Were saying that five, six, seven thousand, how many ever years ago, Adam and Eve and this other group of humans were created by this race of aliens that came to Earth that we call them God and we call them gods because of the technology they possessed, but they actually created humans an image of them and spread us out throughout the world. Then what happened was a war took place between the gods and the humans and our races ended. I mean, their race dwindled and ended out outside of one who became Athena or Minerva, whichever one name you want to call her, be it Roman origin or Greek origin. And uh, then after that, it's, you know, they, you know, the assassins develop and everything else happens. So it's cool to see. Now, my thing about that was what I liked about that game's concept was it was so realistic that when you saw it, you were like, OK, I could picture that happening. I can imagine that being the scenario for why aliens came. In fact, there's another good show called Ancient Aliens. If you ever want to check it out, it comes on the History Channel. And also, I believe they still have it on Netflix. I'm not so sure because I haven't used my Netflix in quite a while. On Ancient Aliens, they basically went to... Ancient Aliens, a program, uses a lot of archaeologists, and a lot of professors, a lot of teachers who do study paranormal activity or who study different cultures across the world that have passed away in time, like Mesopotamia or 
or Persia or all these other ancient civilizations. And the, what they're focusing on is saying that the gods in these ancient civilizations who we held up in high acclamation and said that these were gods and these were wonderful creatures, they said that these people might have actually been extraterrestrials who, in our eyes as humans, we saw as gods because they possessed a technology that we didn't possess yet. Or possess that they possessed an the insight that they didn't, we didn't have. Or did they create an architecture that we couldn't fathom to create? Like, for example, this is like, this is a really big debate. It's always been a really, really big debate on who created the pyramids in ancient Egypt. Because, to put it simply, and I hate to go racial, white people cannot imagine that niggas and brown people made pyramids that long ago. They can't fathom that we can't make that. They're like, well, hell, they can't make the credit rights, so and they can't definitely can't make pyramids. And some of it, some of the theories of some of the theories are based in fact. You know, factually, it would have been quite difficult for you to get a couple thousand humans to put that type of ingenuity together to make pyramids like that, and especially back in those days. But of course, if you go across the world, whether you go into the jungles of Southern America or any other place, you do see that there are other pyramids in the world. So it's not just some rare occurrence of 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 esoteric power. Like it is something that can happen. But, you know, yet again, you have the theories that go against that. I will say the theory that the gods that came before us are of extraterrestrial origin like the gods of our religion, like the Jehovah's and the Greek lords and everything else. I will say that in a lot of ways, I think that makes sense. And there might be some truth to that. The reason that I speak that is because if you think about it, God in himself, if you're Christian, if you're Christian and if you're Muslim, if you're Judaism, if you're Judaic, then you probably will agree with me. God in itself is an esoteric creature. God in itself in all of our religions, he's viewed as somebody who comes from the sky. He's viewed as somebody who comes from a, from another world, created our world, and then stands out, lives, dwells outside of that world and watches over us like a father figure. All of our religions that we have, most of them, the, I'm talking about the monotheistic ones. They have this basis of God coming out of, like I said, is, is this outside creature into our world and creating us. In a sense, you can say that that's an extraterrestrial. Like, I had a big debate about this with my cousin because I told her, in a sense, you can say that God is an alien. Because even if he did create us, he's not the same of us. He comes from a world or some place that we're not familiar with. To this day, it doesn't say in any scripture in the Bible, at least the King James Version, or in the Talmud, or in the Quran, where does God come from? It doesn't say that yet, so... To this day, we still have some confusion of his origins. Now, the debate with that comes is Christians, Muslims, and people who are followers of Judaism, we always like to look at God as like this magical and mystical creature. We don't like to look at him in the, in the eyes of saying he might come from a scientific perspective. You know, I always wonder, this is a theory I always wonder, and I want to ask you what ask you what you think. This is something I really want you guys to comment and let me know how you feel. What what do you think the response would be if we found out that God was our creator, that there was a Jehovah, that he had created us and manufactured us? Watch my wordplay, manufactured us, but it was all through scientific power. What if he really created us through only through the uses of science, through scientific innovation, like how you grow, how we use it, um, how we use a, to a tube to grow a baby in a tube or how we use cloning and any of that? What if we were only created by scientific, scientific process? What if that was the truth? Do you think that if we found that out, will we still look at God as our God? Because I feel like the love and the passion that we have, the fixation that we have with our deities is, isn't so much of what they can do as how they do it. And I think with science, the problem with science is science in itself is a science in itself is a study that takes the magic away from 
it takes the magic away from anything. You know, it removes the curtain from behind the veil and it shows you what's really going on. Science has the power to do that. Science has the power to show you what's really going on. So it removes the mystery and the awe and the inspiration from it. So you look at it a little bit differently. I think that if we found out that God it truly existed, but we were created through scientific methods and not mystical methods, I think that we would probably see it a little bit different. And I feel we would be disenchanted with the image of God that we always had. And it's crazy because I honestly feel that if there is a God, I don't know if he created us through mythical methods. I don't know if he created us through magical methods. I always feel like when it comes to science and mysticism and technology and all those other areas, I feel like science cannot explain everything, but neither can esotericism explain everything. I feel like our world exists in a certain area between these, between those two, between esotericism and science. And the problem with most people is they can't exist in that middle ground between the two. So therefore, they feel some sort of in, in comf, um, uncomfort with talking about. They didn't feel some uncomfort of being a person who's a Christian, but talking about science. They feel discomfort with being a person who follows the path of science, but talking about Christianity because they feel like Christianity goes against all their theories. But I think that in either one, you can find truth, regardless of what you say. You can go into the Christian Bible. You can go into the Talmud, the Quran. I don't care how radical some people take the um, take the translations and you can find jewels of wisdom, uh, jewels of wisdom and stories that relate to you in everyday life. Moments of wisdom, words of wisdom that you can apply to certain situations that you're going through right now, even while we're talking. So it just depends. Now. Does that mean does that mean that if you take those two together, they can combine well? No, because I've seen a lot of different. They have like those these little different societies, like the Christian science societies. And for whatever, for whatever, for whatever way, how they're functioning, you know, that's the thing. But I don't think they combine that well. That's the problem. So if there is aliens, you know, they might be the source of some of our religions. God, there's a small tribe in um in Pacific in the Pacific Islands. I forgot the name of it, but it's a small tribe. Um, it's a Samoan tribe, and they came in contact with one of our presidents. I want to say it was George Washington. I believe in my heart it was George Washington. They came in contact with one of our presidents, and because of the technology that his soldiers possessed, because of the way he carried himself, they believed that this man was an actual deity. So even to this day, if you go to that region, they still worship him as a god. Because from their perspective, they're these tribal people. They're not used to seeing white men with guns and boats and ships and shit. They come there and they're viewed as deities and gods. And they're like, oh my god, this is a god. How can he come here? This man has all this power. He's a god. To this day, they still worship him. Now, if you if you can worship a nigga named George faithfully and believe that that man is a god, then surely, surely, surely you can worship an alien. Just saying. And I know nobody wants to hear that, but you know, it's, it's the truth. You know, I have no problem with saying that. It's just, it is what it is. And to you, if you have an opinion about what I said, if you feel like what I'm saying touched a note with you, then by all means, let me know. Tweet me at JT's Bold Dream. That's J T S B O L D E S T D R E A M. Also, you can find me on Facebook at my Dream for You Publishing Space. That's D R E A M F O R Y O U P U B L I S H I G S. I mean, publishing. Sorry, I spelled that wrong. As you can tell, I have a very, 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 very obvious GED education, and I apologize about that. So, Anyway, next subject of discussion what I want to talk about was bad tasting foods. Now, let me tell you about what's going on with that. So I keep going online and you go to Yelp.com, you go to FODOR.com, you see all these foods where, hold on, let me play some different music because, yeah. All right, sorry, I had to set up a little bit. Sorry, okay, now we're back again. So anyway, 
I keep going online. I keep seeing all these different little places where they talk about how good this food is, how good this food is, how good this is, how good is a Yelp burger, how good is an In-N-Out burger, how In-N-Out burgers are good. Let me give you a hand clap for In-N-Out burgers. In-N-Out burgers are actually pretty bomb. I'm not going to lie about that. In-N-Out burgers are actually pretty good. I'm not going to lie. That is, that's a good one. Or even McDonald's burgers or even Phil's barbecue or even Church's chicken. I decided I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the most overrated foods that I've tried in my life that I think you guys are stuffing in your mouth even now. And I feel like it's just crazy that you even persist with it. So let's start now. First off, first food that I want to tell you that's very, very overrated. I do not know why you guys keep eating this is Taco Bell. Taco Bell is the most terrible. Taco Bell, Taco Bell is literally ghetto, ghetto. Ghetto, 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 but I got all you ghetto Mexican food to anybody who's from California, to anybody who's from anywhere in the Southwest, anybody from a lot of country, they will tell you fervently that if you eat Taco Bell, it tastes like shit on a stick compared to any well, well, well fixed Mexican food, whether it be Alberto's or whether it be Carolina's, whether it be, oh, um, what's that one that's always in uh, Georgia and uh, Texas and Alabama? Um, on the border, off the border, but Taco Bell is just shit food, and it cre- it kills me how popular it is. It kills me how popular it is around amongst Americans because I'm like, because I'm like, bro, you can't tell, you can't taste how terrible this. Sh- excuse me, how terrible this shit tastes. I don't want to eat 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 donkey ass wrapped in a tortilla. Like it's just nasty. It's just it's terrible to me. That's one food. But one thing about Taco Bell, I will say is, Taco Bell has a Talk about the stake in the American culture, about how popular it is with those people who smoke weed from the, around the hours of 7 p.m. to 4 o'clock a.m. and have nowhere to go eat at. And because Taco Bell is open 24 hours a night, 24 hours a day, they go there and they just can spend five dollars and get six or seven different bean burritos and chalupas for 89 cents a piece. In fact, I remember two uh, two weeks ago when they had two three weeks ago when they had the. Um, the NBA Finals, and after Cleveland Cavaliers won, and LeBron James finally stopped feeling like a bitch to everybody, they had a sale on Tuesday where they had a Dorito Taco Tuesday where they had that those shells that taste like Doritos, and they had a sale for it. I ain't gonna lie to you, I almost punked out and bought one while I'm talking so much mess about it. Um, there's nothing wrong if you like Taco Bell. Trust me, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, some of us have some of us have bad taste, but bad taste buds. Maybe you were born with them, you know. Personally, my taste buds are pretty well. And that's why I don't like Taco Bell. That's just my opinion. That's a really overrated food place. Second place that's very, 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 very overrated. And I don't know why people eat here is McDonald's. Well, McDonald's, let me let me let me take that back and think about it. It's not that McDonald's is so much overrated so much as McDonald's just McDonald's I've I've always felt like the prices were too inflated. And I've always felt like the only thing at McDonald's that was really specifically a taste at McDonald's that you couldn't find anywhere else or that you couldn't cook was their fries. McDonald's fries are so country. They're so golden brownly crisp and cooked well to perfection. I'm not going to lie about that. Their fries are good. Like I literally, if there was a McDonald's in my name, when is the last time I had McDonald's? I don't think I've had McDonald's actually, though. Hmm. I don't think I've had McDonald's actually in a, a very long time. I think I haven't had McDonald's in like two or three years, actually. Yeah. Not since I was in college, at least. But yeah, their fries are very good. Their fries are excellent fries. I, I love their fries. But as far as their burgers and their cheeseburgers, <clears throat> I always felt that they were so overpriced compared to how cheap you can get another burger at a Burger King or how you can get one at in and out in and out in and out is a food franchise that a lot of people sleep on. A lot of people don't give the credit that it deserves because they have consistently provided you with perfectly wrapped, well done burgers that taste like heaven wrapped in a bun. Oh my God, give it a hand. Drop a bomb for In and Out. Drop a bomb for In and Out. Like, uh, that, that wasn't a real bomb. Let me, get, let me give you guys a real bomb. That wasn't a real bomb. Boom! That's a real bomb. Boom, boom, bomb. Consistently always provided you with really good food. I love it enough. Their fries taste like shit. I'm not going to lie to you. 
Now, that's the truth about In-N-Out. I love their burgers. Their burgers have no comparison to any other food place on this planet. But however, their fries taste like like ass wrapped in, in, in pig blankets. Like, it is nothing good about their fries at all. But however, I can understand. I think what happens is when you have these certain food companies, now that I think about it is, they have all have an area that they specialize in. And so they kind of stray away from the, they stray away from trying to be good in other areas. Like with McDonald's, how they have burgers, wraps, apple pies, fries, etc., etc., etc. Their areas where they do really good at is the fries and the apple pies. But in my eyes, I feel like the the burgers and everything else aren't really good. But somehow they're still earning the wealth. So I can't knock them. The franchise is worth a couple billion dollars. Of course, they're also saying, though, if you don't know that, they're saying that the food at McDonald's is actually... And they've always said that the food at McDonald's is very unhealthy for you. Truthfully, they they didn't always say that. They started saying that once that Super Size Me movie came out and pretty much uh, shut shit down. But after that came out, what happens is, is I think they said that the, the sales of McDonald's and the actual sales to my generation, which is the 90s and millennials, they said that the sales are dropping because... Our generation, what happened was, is all of us, we grew up thinking that McDonald's is unhealthy for you. We grew up thinking McDonald's is unhealthy for you. You can't eat this food. It's going to make you fat. It's going to make you sick. Whereas the people who grew up in the 80s, 70s, and 60s, they always grew up thinking that fast food was okay with you because at that time, our country wasn't so health-centric. It wasn't so focused on your health and not having diabetes and living past uh, 40 years old without having to go to the hospital every uh, four, four months. So after that, you know, the culture shifted. The culture kind of shifted of how we viewed McDonald's. You know, like I told you, I haven't went to McDonald's in two to three years. But there was a time when you were growing up that that was just a place to go to when you were a kid. Even when I was a kid. Like, I remember being 10 years old and everybody would go hang out at McDonald's or go hang out at um, at Burger King. And then, man, when pizza, when it was, uh, it was pizza, what was it, Domino's? When Domino's came up with the five for five, uh, five dollar medium pizzas, ooh, ooh shoot, let me put that bag up right there. Was it Domino's? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, stop that. Was it Domino's that did that? It was some pizza franchise, I remember as a child, that it came out with a five dollar pizza for you guys, for anybody who wanted to buy one, and it was like a five dollar pizza. I don't remember. Was it Domino's? Was it Little Caesars. It was Little Caesars. It was Little Caesars. I remember. It was Little Caesars. Five dollar, five dollar medium pizza. Five dollars medium pizza. It was Little Caesars. So you know the culture changed. The culture kind of changed with that. I think. I don't know. I'm trying to think of any other food places that I feel are very overrated that you probably should avoid, but you won't listen to me about that because you just you just want to eat. I'm trying to think of some really good ones. Those are the only ones. Those were the first ones that were on my mind. There's one I wanted to talk about particularly is Phil's Barbecue. Phil's Barbecue is this one place in San Diego, and on Fooders.com and on Yelp.com, it's named as one of the best, 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 best places to go eat barbecue at. But I went there four years ago. Then it came back again in 2015 and had it twice. And each time I went there, I thought, who is the old taste taste budless person who reviewed this place because here's the thing the food is good but it's not no better than how my aunt or my uncle anytime i always say this if i go to your establishment and i buy food and at any point in time while i'm eating your food do i feel that i can make it better than how you made it then i shouldn't be eating there that's why I don't like going to Taco Bell. That's why I hate going to McDonald's. That's why I hate going to Jack in the Box. That's why I love going to In-N-Out. Because when I go to In-N-Out, I'm always thinking, damn, I cannot make a burger like this. I cannot make a burger like this. Taco Bell, I can make 55 tacos that taste better than that. I make tacos and shit like that regularly. Trust me, if you come to my house, if you're a lady, you you know you really like me, think I'm cute. You know what's so up? I personally can make you a taco, a croti, um, a quesadilla. Anything better than you can possibly taste at McTaco Bell. Trust and believe in me. The skill is there. 
So that's just my opinion on the food area. Now, because I only have so much time because I have to do my other podcast, which if you're interested in listening to, go ahead and check it out. Um, what also what I want to talk about is I want to talk about exotic pets because I've been thinking about I've really been thinking about buying a lemur. It's really been on my mind a lot. You know, I've done, done a lot of jogging. I thought about it over time, time and time again. I really think I might take my money and invest in buying a lemur for my birthday. A lemur or an otter, one of the two. Of course, lemurs are hard to get because, you know, in America, I think they're illegal in the United States, so I'd have to sneak it. But I know I got a few cousins who are drug dealers, so hell, if they can, hell, if they can sneak, sneak packs of cocaine up their ass, surely they can sneak a baby lemur. But I'm thinking about buying an otter, simply be, a otter or a lemur, because it's so cute, bro. Like, you cannot look at a lemur and think it's not cute. And you cannot look at an otter and think it's not adorable. Like, they're so furry and play withable. Like, oh my god, I want one so bad now. But I think the problem with that is is if I get an otter, I might have to figure out a place where to keep it at. I have to keep bringing it in water. And I've also been reading a lot of reviews who people who own otters have said that if you have an otter, they're very, very hyperjetic. Which is cool because I'm like that. Hyperactive, I mean hyperactive. They're very hyperactive, which is cool. But also, the problem is, is they're so hyperactive that if you have them in your house, nine times out of ten, they're going to tear up everything. They're going to chew through your PS uh, PlayStation cords. They're going to chew through your phone cords. They're going to knock your TV over. They're going to hit your daughter. So, you know, it's a lot of, they have a lot, so much activity and energy that you got to worry about that. But, you know, I'll figure it out. Oh, that's what I want to tell you guys, too. Dude, dude. Last Friday, okay, so I didn't tell you guys that, um, I didn't tell you that last week, these last two weeks, I've been trying so hard to catch a duck. I've been trying so hard. In the neighborhood that I live in, you have these canals and riverways in the back of the houses and everywhere. So when you go there, you have these ducks and swans and geese uh, constantly flying and, you know, just doing whatever. There. So when you go there, you also have a lot of the ducks breeding and laying eggs there. And recently they had like, you know, it was mating season. So they had like a really, really big batch of ducks come out. I had uh, two weeks ago, I dove into one of the canals to try to get one of the little ducklings that were just swimming in the water with their mother. Um, I almost drowned. <laughs> I cut my hand on my right. I cut my hand on my right hand. Text me and let me know if you want me to show you the, uh, the picture of the hole. It's still here. It's healing up pretty fast, but. It was bad. Like I, I almost drowned in the, in the canal. I, bro, I didn't. I didn't think the canal was that deep. Like I jumped in a boat. Like I jumped in it like Aquaman <laughs> with my little net that I got from my uncle. My fishing net. I jumped in it. I was like, get out, doggy! <laughs> I dumped in there, man. Oh, it swam away so fast. And that was the first fail. Then about three days later, I walk into the grocery store, you know, just to buy some groceries and whatever, whatnot. I look to my right and lo and behold, I see a mother and a duckling walking around. And I just immediately, I snap in a hunter mode. I got a ducky. I reach down and try to grab the ducky. I'm like, yeah, I got you, ducky. I got you. I got the ducky. I put it in my pocket. It was so, so cute. It was so cute. I was holding it. Like, I, I've never heard, I've never held a duck before, but when I was holding it, it was just so cute to hold, like the fur and the wings and everything. It was just like, oh my God. Like, most adorable moment. It was just, I was so happy. Let's give a hand clap for me. I caught a duck. I'm a real nigga for that. I caught a duck. I feel so happy about that. So, um, I caught a duck. And, bro, when I caught the duck, all I kept thinking about was, man, maybe I should have went into animal care. You know, when I was growing up, one of my favorite programs to watch was Animal Precinct and also Jeff Corwin's Adventure. You know what? That's who I should interview on here. Dude, I would love that. Jeff Corwin's experience. That's what I should interview on here. Yeah, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. Hey, guys, um, try to message me. How could I find Jeff Corwin's contact information and try to find out how I could get in contact with him? Because I think I want to interview him. I want to try to interview him or the crap or the um the Kraft brothers who used to have that one program called Zabumafu. I've, I've always wanted to have a conversation with them, but 
I just I never thought about it. But now since I have this radio show, I can finally start having the conversation with the stars and the idols that I had as a kid. Which, by the way, from the Good Read podcast, um, which is with for writers and readers and everywhere else, I'm going to start interviewing a couple of famous authors who are out right now who are doing big things like Alan Freewin Jones, Brenda Drake, Cassandra Clare. I have a lot of great people coming on there soon. So if you're interested in that area of fiction and literature, you should check it out. With that being said, my name is JT. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you guys. Um, it's much love every time I hop behind this mic. And you know, it's only you guys that forever and ever and ever I will like. Pleasure and pleasure, my treasures. I love you guys so much. Please like and subscribe to this podcast. I'll be back here tomorrow again at 7 a.m. as always. It's much love. Thank you. Let's go out with my new, with my new theme song.